Travel back in time to the 80s, reliving the advice. Carpe diem. Seize the day. The comebacks. Why don't you take a picture? It'll last longer. <laughs> and the technology. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? Because just like you, we're stuck in the 80s. Can you say stuck in the 80s? Hey, hey, welcome to Stuck in the 80s. It's your host, Steve Spears. And Brad in LA. And today we welcome back an old friend to help us do a deep dive on one of the most epic albums of the 80s. It's our tribute to Moving Pictures by Rush. All right. It's Saturday night. I have no date. A two-liter bottle of Shasta and my all-Rush mixtape. Let's rock. Stuck in the 80s is now listener-supported via Patreon. Join us for VIP Zoom happy hours and more when you join at patreon.com slash stuck in the 80s podcast. Ladies, turn your podcast apps off now because we're going to talk about Rush for a solid hour. <laughs> <laughs> But with us uh, to do a deep dive, we would prefer to do him with him. He's the he's the master diver. It's our good friend Mark Canali, aka Base Note. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good, guys. I will eschew the professor title today because the only professor we should be talking about today is Neil Peart. Ah, yes. And now we finally have the proper pronunciation of the drummer of Rush. Why is this so hard for people? Because we're American and we see an E A R and it's and it's er er er. <laughs> it's funny. I was listening to uh, Rolling Stone interviewed Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson about five years ago, and it was just entirely questions that they got from the internet. And one of the questions was, "How do you pronounce your drummer's name?" Getty Lee has this perfect answer: ear with a p in front of it and a t at the end. Peart. Peart. Now I can remember it. Does it come up in conversation a lot around the office, Steve? Not my office. Everyone I work with is 30 years younger than me. Well, it's a good fact to have in your bucket of facts. Yeah. So let, let's get started with this question. What was everyone's first introduction to Rush? How about you, Mark? I had an older brother who was a huge Rush fan. I heard like stuff from 2112 on when it first came out. I was pretty much on the Rush bandwagon from a very young age. Do you remember the first time you actually bought for yourself? First Rush album I bought for myself was probably Moving Pictures. Okay. Uh, nice. I asked this question with... A bit of skepticism. Brad, what was your first introduction to Rush? Uh, my first introduction to Rush was I was at summer camp, and there was a kid at camp who had moving pictures, and all he would play was Tom Sawyer like six hours a day over and over. And I was like, this is a pretty cool song. I really like this song. After a week of it, I was ready to, you know, I would have murdered Neil, however you pronounce his last name, on site. But that wasn't his fault. That was his kid's fault. Do you remember the kid's name? No, I don't. I can see his weasley little face. I've never <laughs> owned a single Rush album. I never needed to because I knew enough drummers that were all Rush fans. So I could just listen to Rush at their house if I needed to. So I think you'd put me in the casual fan category. Okay, fair enough. Here's how I remember it. 1981, I was, what were we, were we ninth grade, maybe? Uh, eighth grade. Eighth well, grade. Yeah. You would have started high school in the fall of 1981. At this point, I'm under the tutelage of one of my neighbor friends, David, who basically dragged me out of nerddom or dragged me a little bit out of nerddom by telling me what to wear and, and telling me the albums to listen to. And so this was the era when I would just, someone would say, you need to have this album and I would put it on my Christmas list. What's the album cover like? Is my mom going to be okay with it? <laughs> Even my parents were probably perplexed by the album cover of this one. So I, I had this album as a present, I remember. Nice. And I hadn't heard anything on it. I, I hadn't heard a single thing. Someone just said, you, sh you should have moving pictures. So I got it, and I started listening to it. And when the first Rush song you hear is Tom Sawyer, I can tell you one thing. It's a very confusing thing in life. <laughs> <laughs> but I caught on, and I, I enjoyed it. And I went back, and I think I bought every Rush album there was all the way to the very beginning. And wow. then afterwards, I think I bought Signals, and then that was the end of it. 
that's that's where the, the the train ended for me. Mark, have you seen him perform live? I did. I got to see them once, and I got a shout out to my good buddy John Larosa for taking me to see them on their final tour, of the R forty tour in Chicago. Oh man, I've seen I've seen the video of that tour. It just looks amazing. That was the the way they did the show was phenomenal. They literally went from their most current material backward all the way to their their first album, and the stage was devolved as they went. How long was the set? That had to be like a four hour concert. It was about a two and a half hour show with an intermission. Man, that's great. It was great. I mean, it started with their what their their stage set up for the Clockwork Angels album. And it, you know, it would slowly evolve to each era as they were playing it. By the very end, on the encores, they were playing stuff off the first album. The backdrop looked like a school gymnasium. <laughs> and there was a couple of martial amps set up on chairs with a disco ball over the drums. That was the, that was the final setup. And it was great. I mean, everybody loved it. I've seen him twice. <laughs> Here's what's odd. So it, after Moving Pictures, they came out with a live album, which was called Exit Stage Left. And they toured to support a live album, so huh. which which you don't normally see. And I don't know how long of a tour it was. Rush had a hot habit in the '80s of doing a tour in Florida just so they could go to spring training games. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, and, you, you work the system. Yeah, the Toronto Blue Jays, their their hometown team, they trained in my county, so it made sense for them to play St. Petersburg every right. spring. So I saw them on that tour. And then I saw them after we had started the podcast. I want to say it was the snakes and arrows tour. Probably. Yeah. I, I saw them on that and you know, it, it was different. You know, they, they were playing a lot of music from the years that I had dismissed them, you know, and had kind of given up on them. But the musicianship was just as good, if not better than it was 30 years previously. Yeah, what do you think you paid for a concert ticket to see them in 81, 82? 81 like, probably about like 15 bucks, 15 bucks. Yeah. 10 15 yeah, bucks, yeah. Boggles yeah, the mind. Easily. It just <laughs> The t-shirt would have probably cost more than the ticket. Right. Yeah. Um, and I remember the t-shirt, it was the reverse jersey, it was the black shirt with the white sleeves, which were popular for a reason that totally escapes me. But then I got reintroduced to Rush when the documentary about them came out called uh, Beyond the Lighted Stage. Oh, so good. Which I believe you can still watch on Netflix. And I have probably seen it. I, I don't mean to exaggerate, but at least 30 times. Dang. I would so. say the same thing. I, whenever I just lack something to watch, I suddenly turn that one on. And wherever you left off at before, that's yep. fine. I'll pick it up right here. That actually got my wife into Rush. She actually became a Rush fan watching that documentary. I keep telling future wife that she needs to watch it so she understands Rush, and she's just like, nope. It, it, it is on Netflix currently if you need to uh, convince your spouse or yourself that Rush is where it is at. So let's talk about 1981 as a year in music before we get before we dive into moving pictures. Look at all the amazing albums that were released this year. You have Escape from Journey. You have Tattoo You by the Rolling Stones. Uh Ario Speedwagon gives us high infidelity. You have Paradise Theater from Styx. Mm. Let's take a journey away from rock and roll into New Wave. You've got the debut album by Duran Duran, Dare by the Human League, Speak and Spell by Depeche Mode, Kings of the Wild Frontier by Adam and the Ants. Mm. This is a big year in music. There's a lot going on there. Oh, yeah. There's a theory that's bounced around over the decades that 1966 was the year that music exploded during that decade. Uh, I think you can make a similar argument that 1981 was the year when music exploded in the 80s. Am I wrong? I think that's uh, a fair argument. I mean, just from the list you just read. I still say 1984 is like the the pinnacle. But 1981 is where it just kind of like like this takes is off. yeah, this is where we're going. You going to come along? Yeah. <laughs> so that yeah. raises the question, where are we with Rush? Where is Rush in 1981? Base note they had released Permanent Waves in January of 1980, one of their first big, big radio hits, Spirit of Radio, first top five album in the U.S. Yeah, Rush was Rush was actually in a pretty good position in 81. So from a record company standpoint and what they want to do as a band, where are they? What are, what are they looking to do at this point? Are they looking to continue the success? Are they looking to, to chart new ground? 
Well, I know Neil Peart said that they they had like a two year plan at the time that they were going to record a live album and do a tour for the live album, but they had they were doing shows for the Permanent Waves tour and they were actually coming up with some really cool stuff in their during during their sound checks. And Neil Peart was the one that approached the other guys and said, you know, maybe we should uh, go and record a new album. They brought it to the management and the management management was just like, yeah, okay. So they scrapped their two year huh. plan. Rented a cottage in Stone Lake, Ontario that used to belong to a uh, musician named Ronnie Hawkins, who had a band called the Hawks, who most of the band members would quit and form another band. You know, people like Levon Helm and uh, Robbie Robertson, they would form this band called The Band. I believe I've heard of them. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They started writing songs there at the cottage. Nice. Do you know how it came out? Were the hits written first did they have those in their heads first i mean do you know how the material kind of came to them neil would be off by himself writing lyrics and getty and alex would be putting down ideas in the barn i think neil said that that camera i was actually the first song that was written huh interesting that is kind of i mean not to get ahead of ourselves but it is kind of a classic prog rock let's lay down a 10 minute track here you know, well, it's not hard to imagine them kind of starting there. Yeah, the, the last one they would ever record. It feels to me like it's the overture of the album. Before we go into song by song, who's doing the producing at this point? Their producer was their longtime producer, Terry Brown. He had produced the very first album, going back to Fly By Night, was the first album he produced for me. He produced every album up to the, the album that would follow, Moving Picture Signals, would be the last one that he would produce. Can I tell you a quick story about Fly By Night? Every time I hear that name, I cringe a little bit. When I was in college, my freshman year, my roommate was a drummer. This I did not actually know about him until he came back from Christmas break, and he brought his entire drum set with him t- to our dorm room. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. And <laughs> RA's going like, to be pissed. <laughs> like, you know where the story is going. So he sets them up one Saturday afternoon. I mean, it's it's spring in Florida. There's no football games to go to. Our Saturdays are a little, you know, loosely planned. Well, free form. And the one song he knows really well on the drums is Fly By Night. So he would play Fly By Night on the drums until basically the the RAs would come down and shut us down. Cut it out. <laughs> but That's you, so funny. you could hear oh my it. Gosh. You could hear it for blocks. So <laughs> I, I mean, he, he, Dude, they make these things called practice pads. Get some. <laughs> I, I'm still in touch with a guy. He lives in outside of Savannah, Georgia now, and he is a dog groomer who has a tie-dyed bus, and his whole theme is Grateful Dead meets dog grooming. And if you listen closely, you can still hear Fly By Night echoing out the exhaust <laughs> of his VW <laughs> micro bus. I guarantee you he still has the drums, and I guarantee you he still knows how to play Fly By Night. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> i'm sorry poor ken oh, that's fantastic he's the same guy who helped me draw the uh, or helped me paint the asia album cover outside our door we consider so, him redeemed so much of my memories of, of that couple of years revolves around him so speaking of album covers moving pictures has a very unique one what's the story behind that mark uh the triple entendre album cover Done by uh, Hugh Syme, who had done many of their album covers in the past. Like I said, the front and back covers are a triple entendre. On the front cover, you have moving men, moving paintings, the star man, Joan of Arc, and dogs playing poker. Then off to the right side of that picture, you have a family that is being moved to tears by the pictures. Nice. And then you flip over to the back cover, and you see that the whole thing is a movie set. It's being filmed. Three meanings for moving pictures. Had they ever done an album cover like that up until now? It seems to me like their album covers are pretty straightforward up until then. There was some kind of cool stuff on the Permanent Waves cover. There was like a news headline in the paper, uh, Dewey Defeats Truman, that they later had to replace. And then there was like a Coca-Cola sign that Coca-Cola actually got kind of pissed about. So they actually put the band members' names on there in Coca-Cola font. Okay. (laughs) Funny. What else about the cover that is interesting? It was shot on the front steps of the Ontario legislature in, in Toronto's Queen's Park. According to uh, In the Studio with Redbeard, broadcast on uh, February 15th of 2021 this year, the cover was so expensive to stage that the record company refused to pay for it, so the band had to pay the cost wow. themselves. <laughs> that's, that's nuts. 
that's crazy. It's not like there's a bunch of CGI up there or something. I mean, I'm sure the record company paid them back once the album paid so many dividends for them. Oh, uh, really? You think the album? The, you think that the record company was like, "Oh, you know what, guys? Here's some extra money." No hard feelings. <laughs> it's called. It's, it's not show friends, kids. It's show business. Yeah. So let's talk about moving pictures track by track. But on recommendation from Base Note, what we're going to do is we're going to flip it over and we're going to start with side two first. Hmm. So, Base Note, where do we start? The first song we're going to cover was what would traditionally be the beginning of Side 2, The Camera Eye. This was the longest song on the album, clocking in at just under 11 minutes, and it would be the last song that Rush would, be, would record that would be that long. According to a Modern Drummer article that Neil Peart wrote, it was the first song that was written for the album, and it's based on a story of the same name by writer John Dos Passos, who used the camera eye as kind of a way to pan across the cityscape to help develop the characters in his story and tell what was going on. Hmm. When I listened to it the first time, this week after not hearing it in probably 30 years the thing that occurred to me was i was under the inclination that it was an instrumental and it's not i mean the first three minutes are right. instrumental <laughs> maybe that's why i usually give up after that <laughs> oh boy the thing i noticed was that although i'm pretty sure i'd never heard side two of this because like i said that kid at camp just played tom sawyer over and over again but it sounded familiar. Like, I don't know if there are themes that show up in some of the other songs or if there were, you know, kind of, if this was the first song that was written, then I guess this would be where all those ideas started and maybe germinated in other places. But there are parts of it that sound very familiar. That's why I kind of refer to it as an overture of sorts. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. It kind of reminds me of the beginning of 2112, where we're going to build to a story here. Right. The song is in two parts. Part one is New York and part two is London. And it's based on walks that Neil took around both cities at different times. The opening street sounds on the song are actually taken from the 1978 film Superman the Movie, when uh, Clark Kent first comes up to the Daily Planet building. That's odd. Huh. That's some random trivia for sure. If we ask that during uh, 80s trivia on the boat, we're going to... Murdered. <laughs> Murdered. <laughs> <laughs> no jury would convict either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after 10 minutes of the camera eye, we come to the second track on side two, Witch Hunt. Features distorted in the flickering light. Faces are twisted and grotesque. Silent and stern in the sweltering night. Mob moves like demons possessed. Quiet. This song is probably just as relevant today as it was when they first put it out. This is a song about the dangers of the mob mentality and censorship. Lee said that it was actually recorded the same night that John Lennon was oh, shot. Geez. Wow. But they did not find that out until after they had recorded it. It's not one that you, they play very much live. I mean, when, when you talk about the tracks and moving pictures, you, the first four songs are pretty much still set list regulars. But how often do Camera Eye and Witch Hunt ever make a set list anymore? Were they part of uh, R40? No, R40, they only played two songs off of uh, Moving wow. Pictures. And it was uh, Tom Sawyer and YYZ. Really? Yep. Huh. There were other dates where they would actually substitute in Red Barchetta for YYZ. Interesting. I do like the last line in this song, the lyrics, ignorance and prejudice and fear walk hand in hand. Oh, I'm yeah. Like, there you go. The one that they say there are, there are strangers that threaten us, immigrants and infidels. Yeah. They say there are dangers that threaten us in our theaters and bookstore shelves. Yeah. Yeah, like you say, I think this is just as pertinent today. Yeah. In the R40 tour program, Peart wrote in an article called Live It All Again, he talked about recording the mob scene at the beginning of the song, 
which was they did outside of the studio they were recording it. He said, you know, he was the rabble rouser. On a night in early winter with a few snowflakes in the air, we set up a microphone outdoors and acted out the vigilante scene. The rabble rouser was played by yours truly, shouting stuff like, we've got to stand up for law and order and we have to protect our children. The mob I was inciting to mayhem was made up of guys at work, band, crew, and studio guys. Wow. Nice. Lifeson said in, on the, in the studio with Redbeard that they had a bottle of scotch and some of the stuff that they shouted got funnier and funnier as, as the bottle got drained. And he said, listening back to what was recorded in the control room just had everybody in stitches. <laughs> so that leads us to the final song from side two. This is called Vital Signs. This is uh, Rush's take on reggae, I would say. Yes. In the Modern Drummer article, uh, Peart said, Rhythmically, the song was an attempt to bridge the gap between the primal appeal of the rhythmic reggae bounce and the electronic energy of high technology music. Nice. And then in an article in the, on the Moving Pictures Tour program, a Rush newsreel, Peart wrote, Lyrically, it derives from my response to the terminology of techno speak the language of electronics and computers, which often seems to parallel the human machine in the function and interrelationships they employ. Oh, boy. <laughs> Is this there. surprising? Deep, <laughs> deep, deep stuff from the professor well, there. I, yeah. I, 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 mm, <laughs> I, I remember, it? or I mean, <laughs> is it surprising that things that people make mimic people? No, exactly. <laughs> I, I remember the documentary Beyond the Lighted Stage, where they're being interviewed by somebody, and it's about this album, I believe, or it might have been about Permanent Waves. They're asking the trio, "What bands are you being influenced by at this point?" And I, for some reason, this is one of the scenes from the documentary that really sticks with me. Neil says Ultravox and The Police. Really? Which are two bands I would never have associated with Rush. That's really interesting, yeah. Again, a documentary that made me rethink the band and go back and listen to them a little bit more with a different point of view. I think in the same thing, Neil said you know, that they were still young enough and fan enough to be influenced by that right. music. Okay, so that leads us to side one. And now we're to the familiar songs that everyone pretty much knows. Even the even the three female listeners that are still hanging with us at this point. <laughs> even filthy casuals like me know these songs. Okay. I think everyone knows the first song from Moving Pictures. Here it is. Are you, are you covered in uh, with a cold sweat at this point? Actually, you know what? If I could go back to summer camp and occupy that self for a week, I would listen to Tom Sawyer nonstop, trade off on that deal. Where did you go for summer camp, by the way? Uh, camp. No, but I mean, where was the camp? It was in a, <laughs> it was in a little canyon. Uh, not terribly far, like maybe 45 minutes away. Well, okay, so there were a couple camps. How, how deep in this do you want to go? There was church camp. Church camp was at Camp Canyon, and then there was Boy Scout camp. And Boy Scout camp, I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was on a lake. The canyon was better because you could play Frisbee there because it wasn't windy down on the canyon floor like every place else in Oklahoma. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> I I try and make you regret asking me questions. Is I know. It working? And that really gives the podcast an interesting flavor. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 summer camp I remember is, and I think I told this story once before, uh, which is a phrase I find myself saying more and more as we repeat the same stories over and over again. But at least I apologize for it, unlike a previous co-host. Eh, it's um, a little home by the sea, but that's okay. We, Boy Scout camp was in the middle of summer in Florida on a lake. You know, oh, my gosh. It was like Bridge Over River Kwai. It was, yeah. you know, they Never marched got the Berry pr- Berry. Right. They marched the prisoners in. They forced us to stay in in these tents that, you know, are no, no shelter whatsoever. Again, there's no electric fans. There's no air conditioners anywhere. 
And the only thing that we did for fun at night was we took – the one thing that told all the families before we went on camp was make sure you give the kids lots of baby powder or shower to shower. They assured the parents that if kids would just use shower to shower each day, they wouldn't be hot at all. Well, your parents knew that was a lie, but they were ready to get you out of the house. <laughs> I guess. So, I mean, we used the, the powder to do you know faux explosions while we played our kiss tapes. And then, of course, we'd stage the infamous uh, rebellion in the middle of the week when the dehydration was getting to us. And so rather than send us all home, they just distributed salt pills and told us to shut up. <laughs> Man. And that, that, lake not messing around. Wow. that lake is probably about four miles away from where my mom lives now. And, and it's six inches deeper from Spearsy's <laughs> tears all those years ago. I'm telling you, if I could go there and and just fill it with concrete, and turn it into the world's largest test track, I would do it tomorrow. Such are my memories from that summer. Um, well, but anyway, so to- so what's the deal with Tom Sawyer? Let's talk about the song. Tell us about Tom Sawyer. <laughs> by Space Note. The germination for this song goes back to July of 1980 when Rush recorded a song called Battle Scar with fellow Canadian band Max Webster. For their album, Universal Juveniles, Max Webster had a lyricist named Pai Dubois who presented them with a song idea that he thought would be great for Rush. Peart and the band took it and developed it into Tom Sawyer. And Pai Dubois is given a credit as a co-lyricist on the song. Nice. nice. Dubois would also co-write lyrics for uh, three other songs with Peart. Force 10 from the Hold Your Fire album, Between Sun and Moon on the Counterparts album, and the title song for the Tesseraco album. Nice. I'm guessing you tell me because you're you're much more a fan than I am. We've established that, but Peer pretty much did all the writing, right? There wasn't a lot of there. Were, I can't imagine there are a lot of people that even had co-writing credits with him. There's a few on like the earlier albums, uh, okay. 2112. I know there's at least one song called Tears that Getty that Getty Lee actually wrote the music and the lyrics to. Okay. Every once in a while, there's a song here and there on some albums that Getty or Alex would get co-writing credit like, for the lyrics. Yeah. I threw in a couple lines of the chorus, and Neil threw me a bone and gave me a little writer credit there. I would say all of their later albums, Peart did all of the lyrics. Okay. How'd the song do chart-wise? I mean, I I know it wasn't a top 10 hit or anything. I'm surprised that at the number that it, re- it reached number 44. I thought it was actually more popular than that on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Huh. And then uh, number eight on the rock charts. God, that just seems – that doesn't seem high enough. I mean, for a song yeah, that's as ubiquitous as it has become, because yeah. literally anywhere you went in the summer of of eighty one, you heard that song. Of course, <laughs> yeah. If you were near me, nonstop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Getty Lee said he discovered the growling keyboard sound on an Oberheim bass pedal. Love it, love it. And he stated that Tom Sawyer is, in many ways, the quintessential Rust song. The instrumental section of the song grew from what Lee would play on his synthesizer during sound checks. That's cool. The next song kind of surprises me. I remember this song being further on side one. But here it is. It's Red Barchetta. I strip away the earth and breathe And hide a shining car They beat Red Barchetta From a better vanished kind We'll fire a careening engine Responding with a roar All right, Red Barchetta. I love this song. This is my absolute favorite song on the album. Huh. Peart's lyrics were inspired by a story in Road and Track magazine from November of 1973 called A Nice Morning Drive by Richard S. Foster. Peart turned it into a futuristic dystopian story about a time when combustion engines are, are outlawed. A story of a boy who weekly visits his uncle's farm and his uncle preserved for him a 1948 Ferrari 166 MM Barchetta, red, of course, and he would illegally take it out for rides. And, of course, if you listen to the song, you know the rest of the story. The alloy air cars chase him down, and he, he eludes them at the one-lane bridge to go back and dream with his uncle by the fireside. <laughs> have you read the story that this is based on? Uh, I have not read the story. I did research it a little bit, and it's really interesting what the original story was about. Yeah, the original story is actually it's not too different. It's set in 1982, I think. He was feeling pretty down on the motor business in the early 70s, but uh, yeah, the car 
in the story is a little more pedestrian than a Ferrari. It's it's just an MGB Roadster. But yeah, much the same. He gets his gang chased down by these people who want to smash his car. The thing I love about this song is that you, you actually get the feel of driving the way the music is arranged. Yeah. I cannot listen to this song if, I, if I'm driving or I'm going to get a speeding ticket. It's, this is a speeding ticket song. Yeah, yes, this is exactly. definitely a speeding ticket song. And you get pulled over, and if the officer is of the right age, when you you look at him, you say, Red Barquette, and he's like, go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, this song was kind of an anomaly for the band in that they, the, the drum, bass, and guitar part was all recorded in one take. Nice. Hmm. Fun. Respect. <laughs> yeah, especially, I mean, it's because it's, it's such a good good song. I love this song. I remember in concert that was in the early '80s when I saw them on the Exit Stage Left Tour. It was one of the few times where they actually had some sort of graphical or video behind them playing as they play the song, and it was it was sort of like the very rudimentary cartoon version of the story, kind of playing out. But I, I always appreciated that Rush went to the extra trouble of trying to create the full stage experience. I do want to know who this uncle is that he had one of like, I think there were maybe 30 of those cars made the <laughs> 166 mm from the Mil Miglia. Like those cars are, I, I, I don't know if one sold recently, but they've got to be worth tens of millions of dollars at this really? point. Really? Oh yeah. They're beautiful cars. I know that Neil Peart owned two of them when he passed away. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. They were, I mean, they're, they're legendary cars. Okay. I don't think there's anything that's worth tens of millions of dollars to me because I, I could drive. <laughs> well, that's the thing is you probably like Cameron's dad. You just wipe it with a diaper. <laughs> I have a Honda HRV. I don't wipe it with anything. <laughs> I'm just saying if you had access to a car like that. I highly recommend it. You wouldn't drive it. you just it's wipe so it with choice. a diaper. <laughs> the third track on side one of Russia's Moving Pictures is... Y, Y, Z. I actually know what YYZ is. This is the one thing I know about this album. YYZ, or or as, as Americans would say it, YYZ, is the airport code for Toronto's uh, International Airport. The Pearson International Airport in Toronto. I know this because I'm a fan of really obscure airport codes. For example, Orlando is MCO, which makes mm. zero sense unless you realize that it was originally an airbase called McCoy. Hmm. Fresno in California is FAT. Really? Fat? Yeah. Fresno Air Terminal. But, you know, uh, if you put that tag on someone's luggage, they're like, hey. <laughs> don't get personal. Tell us about YYZ, base note. The opening of the song is actually the Morse code for YYZ. They were flying into the airport on a friend's uh, private plane. And they heard the Morse code coming over the radio, and, and Neil thought, oh, that would be like a real cool rhythm to play. The song was a jam between uh, Lee and Peart. Alex Lifeson was off somewhere else that day, and they came up with the song. So this is the one song in the album that Neil Peart as actually has a music writing credit on. Huh. Lifeson would come in later and add his guitar part over it. They would actually score a Grammy nomination for this one, correct? Yes, they would score a Grammy nomination, but they would lose to the police for the song Behind My Camel. <laughs> oh, man. Damn camels. Never bet against a mammal with humps. <laughs> that brings us up to, I, I think this is probably my favorite song on the album. I love being in a concert arena when this song begins to play because everybody explodes. This is Limelight. Must 
Okay, just on a note for this song, I finally saw the movie I Love You, Man, the other day, <laughs> where Rush actually appears in the movie playing this song. That's a funny movie. The two of them just going Slap nuts. Slap the bass. Slap the bass. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the girlfriend just looking at him like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they actually had a... Um, a clip that they played in concert during the intermission of the two actors breaking into their dressing room and eating Neil Peart's sandwich and then the band coming in and busting them. (laughs) I think you can actually find it on YouTube. It is hilarious. It is absolutely hilarious. I haven't seen that movie in a while. I need to cue that up tonight. I could use the laughs. You know, the first uh, uh, song that we ever uh, uh, jammed out to uh, was uh, Tom Soye. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, we couldn't do the drums. No one can do the drums like you. What we did uh, is like, da 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 what did you call that song? Oh, I know it's Tom, uh, you, it's called Tom Sawyer, but I love it in, in the song when you go, uh, you know, modern day warrior, mean, mean stride. Today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean pride. I don't think I say it like that. No, I'm pretty sure you say Tom Sawyer. I think this is probably the most accessible song yeah, it's for most def- 80s fans. Definitely the most personal lyric for Peart himself. I mean, this is just based on him being uncomfortable with fame and it's an intrusion into his personal life. He was admittedly an introvert, and he stated uh, that extroverts just don't understand introverts. In uh, Beyond the Lighted Stage, he said, people have a fantasy I don't want to trample on, but I also don't want to live it. Mm. I mean, and then you have the the famous line from the song, I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. You know, that was Neil Peart in a nutshell. That's why when they used to do meet and greets, it would just be Alex and Getty. Yep. Oh, really? He wouldn't, he just wouldn't come. Nope. No, he, he was just so uncomfortable around strangers. He just, I, I, yeah. I mean, I get that. I don't want to compare us to Rush because that's a big, big, big stretch. But I know there are times when people that hear us talk and they hear us talk about stuff on the podcast and they feel like they know us and they come to us and we know nothing about them. The information imbalance is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, Brad. It's, it's, it's really strange on the cruise sometimes when people come up to us and, start telling us stories about us. Like uh, the time you guys were doing this and you, you put and the, the rum in your and, pants and <laughs> yeah. And, and this, and I'm and like, this. wait, how do you know? Oh, right. That's right. We've and told I, you know, it's, it's flattering. Don't get me wrong, but it's a little strange. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can kind of understand where Neil's coming from here. I'm not uncomfortable with it. It just always surprises me. Well, it's your humility that makes you a good podcast host. Well, Steve. When anybody even recognizes me, I'm surprised to be honest. I've never been recognized in public. Thank God. When we were in L.A., oh, God, it was probably 10 or 12 years ago now. Oh, yeah, at the Hollywood Bowl. Someone recognized you, didn't they? Uh, well, I was wearing a Stuck in the 80s shirt, and I was – I'd gotten lost from the rest of us or whatever we were. That's a confusing venue, to say the least. Someone goes, oh, my God, Stuck in the 80s. Do you know Steve Spears? I go, I am Steve Spears. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just one of these weird kind of moments. Know like, him. I saw him shaving this morning. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that was a surreal moment. Have you ever heard from that guy again? I don't think so. Oh, that's weird. Are you out there, Hollywood Bowl man? Well, that was a long touch. time ago. Yeah. If you're out there, drop me a line. I, we at least owe you a bottle opener. <laughs> I still have that. It's a really ratty looking shirt that I had made from Cafe Press like – I think it's oh, like yeah. neon green and it had our old logo on it. It's like saucy stand out like a tick on a white dog. But I mean, it was, it was, you know, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better ask your friend, the dog groomer. <laughs> so the album being done, what was the reception like? Does anyone remember reading reviews of, of moving pictures? I will say in 1981, I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to the music press. No, <laughs> I want to say that Rolling Stone was always tough on Rush. I mean, they were notoriously not on board. Oh, yeah. I want to believe that that sort of kind of began to change with moving pictures. I can't find a copy of the review anywhere. Hmm. The one copy I did find was All Music, which I don't even know how much importance I give to them. But they wrote, quote, Not only is 1981's Moving Pictures Rush's best album, 
It is undeniably one of the greatest hard rock albums of all time. The new wave meets hard rock approach of permanent waves is honed to perfection. All seven of the tracks are classics. Boom. Rolling Stone did, however, put moving pictures on their list of 500 uh, best albums of all time. Anyone want to ponder where it might have landed among those 500? Probably in the lower section. Yeah. Uh, number th- <laughs> 379. Hmm. In that compilation, they did say, quote, moving pictures was the record where they proved that they could say as much in four minutes as they previously had in 20. <laughs> Jeez. There's that. That's Damn. what we call a backslap. That's damning you with faint praise. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, on their list of 50 greatest prog rock albums, Moving Pictures comes in at number three, even though I do not consider this a prog rock album. Uh, it's as prog rock as prog rock was in the early 80s. Yeah, it's got songs that aren't in 4-4 time signature, so therefore people are going to put it in the prog rock yeah. category. You know what else I put in the prog rock category? The Seggies. it's time for I Want My Mystery TV theme song. Uh, the second we replay a snippet of a theme song from the 80s, a show that most likely none of us watched, or at least the three of us. And uh, if you get it right, you're going to the drawing for the um, Postal Friendly Bottle Opener. Ooh. We, we still have some, Brad? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a healthy supply laid in for the pandemic, and I'm metering them out carefully to loyal and worthy winners. Remember, you got to email us to enter you can't just leave a comment on the website i mean if you could find a carrier pigeon you could send one but you knock on our door actually don't ever knock on my door yeah, I mean, if you knock on the door i'm calling the cops <laughs> i never i don't know about you guys but i don't unless i'm expecting someone i don't answer the door if someone knocks on it we had actually here's a complete aside so this morning while we're getting ready to record i had a helicopter circling my neighborhood with someone on the the you know the pa on the helicopter attention there is a wanted felon loose in the neighborhood hiding someplace. No shoes. No shoes. Like, gives us this whole description. Please check your backyard and your neighbor's backyard. I'm like, no, thank I'm you. sure as hell not going to go check the neighbor's <laughs> yeah. backyard. Step I'm outside and try and get killed. Yeah. I'm going to lock the doors and windows and peer through the shades, you idiots. <laughs> oh, my God. That's incredible. Yeah, I guess they caught him because the helicopter is no longer circling. Base note, do you open the door if someone knocks unless you're expecting it? I will look out the window. It's close enough that I can look out and see who it is. So if it's somebody I recognize, I'll open the door. If not, I'll just be like, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> My neighbors know the routine by now. It's like, if you need me, text me, and then I'll come out. Yeah. Steve, I'm going to come over and bring you a pie, I beg. No one has ever brought me a pie. go out there, and it's like, oh, no, it's a process server. <laughs> I deny paternity of all these children. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, pay attention. Here was the clip from the last time we did this seggy. Yep, that's the clip from Days of Our Lives. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. This is MacDonald Carey, and these are the days of our lives. Ah, like sand through the hourglass, so goes the podcast of our lives. Do you know how many people, when they emailed in, actually did quote that line? A lot. Most of them. (laughs) Most of them, yeah. You know we're starting to scratch the bottom of the barrel when we're using uh, soap opera theme songs for this. But that was the theme song for a very, very long time. I mean, for decades long, that was the theme song. So Got their money's worth out of that one. We did have some winners. Brad, read some winners. Nothing would please me more, Steve. Winners this week include Jason in Memphis, John Ross from Charlotte, North Carolina, Kevin Serving Wench, Richard on Alameda Island in the San Francisco Bay. It's very specific, Richard. David Sensei in Tokyo, Chris B. Critter, Carol Parrott, David Larson, John in Dallas, Chuck Whaley, Dale in Portland, Sonia Ruff, Michael Mockrock Hayes, Alvin Wilson, Dallas in St. Joe, Missouri, Wendy Maloney, Todd in Minnesota. Apology accepted, Captain Nita. Mild Bill Monty, Tom Corn in Austria, Anastasia in Colorado, Chris Deepcut Sampson, and 
Carlos M. Hernandez. Base note, why don't you take a turn and uh, spin the wheel and see who wins the, uh, the, the Postal Friendly Bottle Opener. Oh, goody. Okay, here we go. Ah! Oh. Ooh, that was good. Yeah, nicely done. <laughs> I don't know why I get such a kick out of that. <laughs> it looks like it's going to land on Wendy Maloney. You are this week's winner. Email us your postal address, your mailing address. Your coordinates, and uh, Brad will send you a poster friendly <laughs> bottle opener. In the meantime, pay attention. Here's this week's mystery TV clip. If you know it, email us at podcast at sits.com and tune in a few weeks to find out if you're a winner. We'll be right back after this commercial break. K Tales making waves, sound waves with sensational Diana Ross. I said upside down, you me. Rocky Burnett. The sound wave sizzle with Pat Benatar, Let's your Prairie serious. League, and Jermaine Jackson. Robbie Dupree. Wave after wave with air supply, the spinners, and lip sync. Today's biggest hits on sound waves in tune with the 80s from K Tell. Available at these and other fine stores. And we're back, and I thought, hey, we've got a few minutes left. Let's talk about where Rush ranks among power trios. And I'm not; these mm. don't have to specifically be 80s power trios, but it doesn't hurt <laughs> since the show is mainly about that. <laughs> I mean, if you oh, want to, man. you can sort of say that Buddy Holly and the Crickets were a power trio. Um, yeah, that's a different podcast. Or they had no power. That's a podcast where they mail cassettes around. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so let's think about this for a minute. Let's name some other power trios. The one that comes to me, obviously, first, because they're another Canadian band, is Triumph. Okay. Uh, Great band. Love that band. The Police. Yeah, The Police was the first one that came to mind for me. I mean, the first one that came to mind for me is obviously the, you know, the the godfather of power trios, Cream. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. One of my favorites, Violent Femmes. Okay. Uh, don't forget ZZ Top. Oh, that's right. Oh, Why yeah. do I always forget that they're a trio? The little band from Texas. The beards just confuse and bedazzle you. I saw them in concert once. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I, I don't even think I would know them except for you know, that Carl Palmer would go on to play with Asia. The Outfield. Oh, The Outfield. That's right. Mm, okay. The Jam. I can hear Dave Augie August screaming in the background, Motorhead! Motorhead! <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dim would be yelling, who's Yes. Fair. Yeah. Stray Cats. Oh, Stray Cats. Jeez. <sighs> Nirvana, too. Don't forget them. Uh, okay, so if that's the pool that we're pulling from today. I'm comfortable putting Rush in the top five of that list easily. Oh, yeah. I, easily. I, I think they would be. And I'm not even a big fan. I, think, I mean, they're up there with the police and ZZ Top. Well, they certainly had more longevity than the police. If you're giving credit, I think for they that, had more then, longevity than anybody, than anybody on, on that list. I, yeah, really. I mean, yeah. maybe except for ZZ Top. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would, I would personally say top three, but Brad's obviously. I'm shading it a little bit because I don't really want to give you a list, but I'm saying <laughs> yes, I acknowledge their goodness. <laughs> I'm a Rush fan, so I will definitely say top three. Yeah, top three. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed the deep dive on moving pictures. It's definitely an album you want to go back and listen to again. You don't have to start with side two like we did, but it certainly makes it a little bit more fun. In the meantime, hey, continue to suggest albums that you want deep dives on, and we'll take a look. 1981 was rich with amazing albums, and we're going to tackle them because we're right here, hopelessly stuck in the 80s. Stuck in the 80s is now on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash stuck in the 80s podcast. Special thanks to Check Battery Daily for our theme music. And thanks for listening.